We're going to interview Olivia Schmidt, who is with Bark. What what's your what you doing there? I'm the program director. Program director. Now we'll get into what that means in a little while too, <laughs> as well. So uh, we're we're going to uh, talk a little bit about two timber sales. One is Jazz, which is just about through its uh, National Environmental Policy Act process, and one Horseshoe, which is up at Zigzag. And that is just beginning its process. And maybe we should just talk a little bit first, you know, just in a thumbnail sketch, because we talk about BARC a lot. But just for folks that may not know what BARC is and what they do. Sure. BARC, uh, we're the Defenders of Mount Hood National Forest. So you just work just on that. Yeah, we're, we defend and restore Mount Hood National Forest and a little bit of the surrounding public lands. Um, we do a few things that are pertinent to the public. We offer a free public hike on the second Sunday of every month where we bring folks out into the forest to... Um, see what's happening on the ground, look at areas that are threatened by proposed timber sales, see areas that have had some restoration work done, pick mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, we get folks out on the ground because we think it's important for people to connect with their public lands. Uh, we also do something called ground truthing, which is sort of like civilian surveys where we take the documentation from the Forest Service where they're talking about what they're planning to do and what's on the ground and we sort of fact check that based on what's actually out there in the forest and mostly what we're doing there is finding discrepancies between what's in documentation and what's on the ground and we use that information gathered by volunteers to help fight timber sales um, in Mount Hood mm -hmm. um, and uh, we offer trainings for the public on NEPA the National Environmental Policy Act to help folks understand how they can engage in the decisions made on uh, our national forest because they are our public land that's right and we have the right to have a say over what happens there in spite of what George Bush said, because <laughs> right? I know during his regime, they were trying to lock the public out through cert certain kinds of sales. Mm -hmm. And uh, th those are all in the past, hopefully. Well, yeah, but, uh, I'm not sure I would characterize it that way, Yeah, <laughs> we, but we just we have to be there and fight for our... Uh, right to have a say of what happens in in our public lands and NEPA the National Environmental Policy Act is part of what allows us to do that basically says that the the government has to analyze impacts to public lands and with environmental impact and that the public has a right to engage in that process with them mm -hmm. and that's what you do besides going out there and doing it yourself you encourage other folks to do it and I know you you collect signatures and, and, uh, yeah. and petitions and things for uh, on some of these issues as well yeah we like to help people connect with that decision making process so they can have their say we also do things like we lobby the Congress to ensure that we have funding for things like road decommissioning and recreation management on our public lands. so mm -hmm. we're, we're you know we want to help people be activists for our local urban forest which is Mount Hood right and I know uh, I was I was asked to join the bark board back in the very beginning and uh, actually, before it was a, it was Bark as a, as a nonprofit, and that was like April of two thousand or uh, nineteen ninety nine. Mm -hmm. So we're we've been into it for some time. Yeah. And Good. and the, and the organization has grown. It has gotten to the point now, like in the early two thousand, there was uh, Cascadia Forest Alliance. There was a number of forest oriented groups, and all that's pretty much gone away. So Bark has specifically is the, is mainly the only one other than the. Uh, what used to be Oregon Natural Resources Council, which is now what Oregon, Oregon Wild? Wild, Oregon Wild, and 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 uh, they're a much larger group, and they uh, they they work on uh, more into leg legislative. Don't they? Yeah, they do all kinds of work. Um, one of the things that they're really active in on Mount Hood is um, seeking wilderness to establish wilderness areas, protection for areas in Mount Hood they, National Forest. They've been Forest. successful at that. Yes, as well. they have, and they're continuing to work on that mm -hmm. as well. Well, that's important. So that's something I was going to ask towards later in the program, possibly. But you know, in, in your opinion, now you may not be able to speak for Bark in this, but but I know Bark is a, is a is, is they are working on quiet recreation yes as opposed to you know four-wheelers and all the different things that they do but why is having wilderness important well it creates congressional designations that protect uh, parts of the forest from things like logging or or industrial developments things that would have an impact on wildlife habitat water quality um, we have a lot of good wilderness in Mount Hood um, and in fact both of the timber cells that we're talking about tonight are timber cells that come right up against the boundary of wilderness areas um, the jazz timber sale butts up against the bowl of the woods, of the woods wilderness, right. and the uh, horseshoe timber sale would butt up right against the Mount Hood wilderness so one of the issues that we have is you know we've got these great pockets of our forest that are that are 
tucked away, you know, to be protected so that we can get back to our natural systems there. Um, but we still have a Forest Service that's just itching to get right up to the, to as close as they can to that boundary to cut to cut mm -hmm. trees out of our forest. So, and so we, we talk about the Forest Service most of the time, and sometimes the Bureau of Land Management. Mm -hmm. One is the Department of Agriculture, one is the Department of the Interior, mm -hmm. and they have different ways of looking at it. And, and, the, and the, uh, the jazz timber sale, as you were talking about, that is in the far southern Clackamas Ranger District, right above the Bow of the Woods, and actually just before you go over the, over the mountains and, and get into the watershed for for a, that goes down to Detroit Lake and the Brighton Bush. Yeah. So so it's a ways away. Yeah. There are there are parts of the Jazz Timber Sale that are very near to to um, Bagby Hot Springs, mm -hmm. for example, right in that area. And we have a map, but I don't think it'll show up. No, we may not. not we may not. <laughs> we may not get to that. Right. But unfortunately, we don't. And you know, when I when I make this up and, and get it up online, I, I can maybe pop some of that stuff sure. in. So that'll that'll help a yeah. little bit, so people people can see what we're talking about. But uh, since j since Jazz has been going, has, has been in, in the mix or in the process for some time. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that. I mean, yeah. they, they uh, publish in some manner or another that, that this is a timber sale they're going to do. And uh, once you get the word that they're going to have a, a timber sale, kind of let us know how it goes from there. Sure, sure. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that process, and then maybe I can jump into some details about jazz. Um, right, sure. Yeah, so... So, or let's just use jazz as an example. So with the jazz timber sale, we get um, something called the SOPA, the Schedule of Proposed Actions. And that's something that's published quarterly by the Forest Service. And it's a slew of projects that are, they can, they're kind of saying, expect this to be coming up. And depending on what we're seeing there, there you know, there's very little detail at that point. Um, but uh, that's kind of what we call the pre-scoping phase. And mm -hmm. that's a time for BARC when we're, you know, getting a sense of where the project is in general. We may be calling the Forest Service to find out more details. And we immediately start getting folks on the ground um, doing ground truthing. So these sort of civilian surveys. Um, a lot of our ground truthing happens in the scoping phase, which is when the Forest Service issues really kind of vague maps, a sort of general sense of what to expect in the timber sale. With the Jazz timber sale, it's 2,000 acres spread over 30 square miles in the Kalawash watershed. So it's not 2,000 acres in a square, it's 2,000 acres of bits and pieces here exactly, and there. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's dozens of units of, of, of units, you know, several acres a piece, or even hundreds of acres a piece. Um, uh, spread over this 30 square mile area. And with the Jazz Timber Sale, it impacts the entire Kalawash watershed, which is a sub watershed of the Clackamas River mm -hmm. watershed, part of Clackamas, uh, Clackamas County's drinking water. And the Kalawash watershed is the most geologically unstable um, watershed in Mount Hood National Forest. So we're talking about 2,000 acres of logging in an area extremely prone to earth flows and landslides with, you know, but from Bark's perspective, some pretty severe water quality concerns, partly because it's drinking water and partly because of fish habitat. But, um, you know, the, the, so they go through this scoping process, kind of this is what we're thinking about doing. Then they issue something called a PA or a preliminary assessment where it's a little more detail, you know, better maps, um, information about roads. The maps ap a actually depict the areas that you're going to be looking right, at. Right, exactly. And, then, um, and information from the Forest Service about what, they plan to do there and what they think is on the ground. Now, the Jazz Timber Sale is a great example of how the Forest Service um, doesn't exactly have the capacity to do meaningful analysis of their proposals. Bark spent 600 volunteer and staff hours, or volunteer hours, um, ground truthing the Jazz Timber Sale. We, we saw every unit of that sale. The Forest Service does not have the funding or the staff or the ability to do that level of analysis on the ground. So when we were out there, we found things like streams on the landscape that didn't show up on the maps, which is important because when you're planning a timber sale, you ought to know where there is mm -hmm. water. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, other things like roads that are listed on the maps but don't exist on the landscape. And vice versa. Right. Sure, in. sure. Um, and uh, so once, so, and, and throughout this process, throughout the scoping process and during the preliminary assessment process, um, we're submitting comments to the Forest Service. We're saying, hey, you missed a stream here. You know, we're really concerned about the quality of this forest being cut. Um, 
After they receive comments on the preliminary assessment, they issue something called an EA or an environmental assessment. And what's, what's strange is that at the same time that they issue their EA, their environmental assessment, which is essentially a second draft of the initial PA, the preliminary assessment, they also issue their decision. So they say, we'll collect your comments, we're going to issue this document that's theoretically, although largely does not, reflect the comments that we received. And at the same time as they issue that EA, they issue a decision. So there's no opportunity between getting that second draft and the decision that they make for us to come back again and comment. So that's a, a problem with the process um, for some of these timber sales. Once and, and that's what happened with this. Exactly. Um, once you have the EA in hand and the decision, you have the right to appeal if you have commented throughout the process. Um, so, so that's something people should know that if you're not involved in this process, uh, you can't comment then. Right. You, you need to comment on the proposal if you want to challenge the decision. And BARC comments on every proposal in Mountain National Forest. Um, the jazz timber sale is hugely problematic for a variety of reasons. I think the most um, compelling and, and the most concerning issue is the roads. Um, the jazz timber sale would require the reopening of 12 <coughs> miles of previously decommissioned roads. And that's active decommissioning and passive decommissioning. So for 12 of these miles, the Forest Service has either said this road has naturally recovered on the landscape after, you know, decades of clear cutting and mm -hmm. logging in this area. This road has been left and is now, you know, has trees growing in it, doesn't exist on the landscape, doesn't have access to public um, vehicles or m also concerning um, roads that have been actively decommissioned. There's an example in the jazz timber sale of a road that was 0.9 miles of a road that was actively decommissioned in 2010. So the Forest Service analyzed this road, invested the, the funds to take out the road, rip it up, put a berm at the front, the whole 0.9 miles of this road. Now they're going to go back into that road, reopen that road, and then at the end of logging, berm the front of the road, so build like a big mound that would pre theoretically prevent access, and then rip the first quarter mile of the road. So we're losing the ecological benefit and the financial investment in just one of these roads um, in the Jazz Timber Sale. And, you know, that just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. And what's, what's really difficult to swallow is that this timber sale, the jazz timber sale, is being called restoration. It's a, it's a restoration thin, um, and they're claiming in their documentation that there will be a benefit to the watershed by, you know, building the roads and using the heavy machinery and infrastructure, the, the logging landings where they store the logs after being cut. All this infrastructure is going to be put into this delicate, you know, um, landslide prone watershed, and then they're going to back out of it and they're going to leave roads less decommissioned than when they went in. So BARC is challenging this proposal um, based on a variety of issues. Is that a, a legal thing you're challenging right, it? Or? Right now it's an administrative appeal. So what we've done mm -hmm. is we've appealed to the forest supervisor who approved the decision. Once we exhaust the administrative appeal process, um, we have the option of litigating on the sale. And if our issues are not resolved, that's likely what we'll do. Um, there are two other key things about the jazz timber sale that are problematic, um, one of which has to do with roads again. So we have the issue of reopening these 12 miles of previously decommissioned roads, but we also have one, and, and some of those roads don't even, I mean, you can't see them. You go to the forest and you, you can't look and see, find a road there, even though on a map by the Forest Service, there's a road on the mm -hmm. map, you know. Um, roads are hugely damaging to watersheds. They, in, they um, produce sediment and runoff into streams. They damage water quality. They threaten fish habitat. So, and and the, the Forest Service itself has a 10-year-old has a mandate to what's called right-size the road system, or at least, which basically means take the 
three to four thousand miles of roads that you have on your landscape in Mount Hood National Mount Forest Hood, right. um, and bring it down to about half that, which is, according to the Forest Service, a manageable amount That's of road system. That's a major system. Uh, undertaking. Right. And how are we ever going to get there if we are going in and undoing the road decommissioning work mm -hmm. that is inching us toward that goal, which is what the jazz, mm -hmm. the jazz timber sale would do. But if you were to ask the Forest Service why they're doing this, would they say because Congress is mandating a certain amount of timber that has to come out of it? Well, what the Forest is Service what would say is, oh, my gosh, if we don't get in there and log these forests, they're just going to be unhealthy. You know, the Forest Service attitude is that a forest must be logged to have health in the forest. It doesn't, it's not an argument that makes sense to someone who's standing in a forest, you know, but what it really comes down to is mm -hmm. the Forest Service trying to use commercial logging to resolve the problems that have been created by oh. commercial logging. We have decades and decades and decades of logging in Mount Hood, clear cutting, replanting, recutting again, and, and Bark questions that mentality, you know, can, commercial logging resolve the problems that were created by commercial logging. In other words, an unruly road system, you know, forests that were clear cut and then replanted in, an, in, a, in monocultures. Um, what the science says is that if you just leave the forest alone, it will heal itself. Um, even the jazz uh, environmental assessment identifies that if they didn't go into the jazz timber sale in 200 years, it would achieve the same um, sort of quality that they're trying to accomplish by going in there and building roads and running heavy machinery over a, over a, del a, a hydrologically sensitive watershed, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and cutting out these, these trees in, in an area that is actually designated in the Forest Service as late successional reserve, which is basically forests that are intended to become old growth, and riparian reserves, which are areas around streams that are protected for the sake of um, improving or maintaining fish habitat. So, mm. um, you know, so, so the jazz timber sale has a lot of problems. One is that they want to reopen these roads. Um, another is that the Forest Service uses something called best management practices or BMPs. And they're basically a standard of a set of rules that you use to implement timber sales that is supposed to minimize the impact to watersheds. But what we find in Mount Hood, going into places that have been logged and monitoring those areas, and even the Forest Service itself has admitted that the BMPs, these best management practices, are e often either not implemented or not, it, when they are implemented, they're not adequate to to actually affect what they're trying to do, which is to minimize the harm. I would think that perhaps those BMPs would be one size fits all, whereas these places are completely different. Well, yeah. Is that, and the, is and it, could that be part of the what the BMPs problem is? BMPs are designed for each well, the set of BMPs that is implemented to an individual sale is based on that individual sale. Oh, okay. But the problem is, and I think this goes back to the same issue of the Forest Service not really having the resources to do thorough analysis before the sale, but they don't have the resources to administer timber sales on the ground. So what we have seen, for example, in a timber sale called the Swag Timber Sale is um, trees that are marked to be left standing that are cut. And you can see, I mean, the log, the tree is there on the ground with the mark to be left on the ground. We found a tree that was 172 years old that was cut in the swag timber sale. Those things, you know, the documentation promises that those things won't happen. But that's what's happening on the ground. And that's what we expect will happen in the jazz timber sale if it moves forward. Mm -hmm. um, more troubling maybe is that in the jazz timber sale itself in the the final decision and, and environmental assessment those bmps are actually written in a much more loose way we see things like um the word generally inserted into bmps so the for you know the the timber operator will generally not um have skid trails on slopes that are over 40 percent you know what we want to see is that that won't happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as long as the Forest Service doesn't have the resources or the interest in administering those sales properly on the ground, you know, there's there's nobody out there. In and the public is excluded from being there because of safety concerns around, you know, felling trees. So, mm -hmm. so we've challenged the timber sale on that issue of the road reopening. So this, this is the final stretch pretty much right now. 
Right. Right now we're in we're in um, the appeal the administrative appeal process, and the next step will be you know to to take our administrative appeal to the next higher level, which is the regional office. Right now we're dealing with Mount Hood National Forest, but the regional office will review that if we're not able to come to resolution with Mount Hood National Forest. And from that point on, we have the ability to litigate the sale if we choose to do that. So then it'd be up to a judge then. Right. And, and one of the issues that we have in jazz is that the Forest Service went into the Jazz Timber Sale and did work on roads to reopen roads that were closed before making their final decision on Jazz, and that is explicitly prohibited by law. So what we have is the Forest Service saying, you know, we're considering doing this timber sale. We haven't made our decision yet to do this timber sale. And on the other side, going in and opening roads for the sole purpose of administering that sale. So it's a question of trust. You know, how can we trust our public land managers mm -hmm. that they are, in fact, weighing the information, considering the comments that are being provided by the public, considering the information that they're coming back from their biologists, when at the same time as they're supposed to be considering that information, yeah. they're going ahead and doing administrative work to prepare that timber sale. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned roads a few times, and, and I think that uh, we could probably talk a little bit about the fact that uh, the Forest Service nationwide, and uh, very specifically in the Northwest, loses money on timber sales, millions of dollars yearly. And uh, a lot of the reason why is because uh, when they sell off these rights to do the timber cutting to the, uh, to the logging companies, Logging companies don't build the roads. Tax dollars build the roads. Well, isn't that and, how that works? And or the logging company does the road work in exchange, like as a part of. Yes, I. You're right. But in there's the, a trade involved. Yeah, sometimes. exactly. It's like the so the the logging company will say we'll build this road and then we'll decommission it, but that's money that we're not going to give you because that's going to cost thing, us money. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a it's a really devastating situation. It's a sweetheart deal for the timber company. Well, and what we have is you know uh, uh, the Forest Service is supposed to be managing for recreation and for water. You know, it's not just timber that the Forest Service is supposed to be managing our public land, our, our national forest for. Um, part of the problem is that we have a really outdated management plan. The the F Mount Hood Forest Plan was written in 1990, um, and it's been overdue for revision for several years. And so what we're dealing with is a mandate to our public land managers um, that doesn't include things like climate change. You know, it's a, it's a 20th century sensibility in a 21st century time. And mm -hmm. what we need to see is... But even even that said, they even in that mandate, they are supposed to be managing for um, recreation and, and water quality in addition to timber production. Um, we don't think that's, I mean, we're not seeing those things balanced. Um, a great example of that is that this last year, the Forest Service transferred the management of the last remaining developed recreation sites in Mount Hood National Forest to private concessionaires, to private companies for profit. And there was no... No uh, chance for the public to weigh in on that? Initially, they, they were going to try to do it without any public input. We, we and uh, many um, recreation interest groups, you know, harp, like, had a huge, there was a huge outcry about that. You know, how can you be privatizing management of these recreation sites? The, the, literally, the last remaining recreation sites in Mountain National Forest that were still managed by the Forest Service um, without any input from the public. So we pushed back on them, and they decided to, yes, they would go forward and do a process that would include public comment. Um, we you know, issued our public comment, we attended meetings with them, and, and still they decided to move forward with privatizing management well, of those sites. don't they usually? There's always the no action choice, but they never take the no action. Right. So whether it's a timber sale or what you're saying. Right. And, and so what we, ha we are now in the position where BARC is, in a, is involved in a national lawsuit over it, it affecting three western states, um, challenging not the decision in Mount Hood National Forest to, to privatize management, but the actual, um, the, uh, the sort of function used by the, by the Forest Service in various places to allow private 
management. Essentially, what we've realized is that the Forest Service, if it was going to charge fees at these sites, would be held to a standard that they are not held holding these private companies to. Mm -hmm. So they're basically skirting around a law in order to allow private companies to profit off of our public lands at the expense of people who visit our public national forest, which should be open to the public. We should have mm -hmm. access. We, we, we already pay for our public lands through our taxes, you know? Right. So we shouldn't be paying an additional $5 to access the Clackamas River at the Big Eddie Day Use site, for example, which is one of the sites in our appeal, or paying money to soak at Bagby Hot Springs when, uh, I mean, our, it's the tax dollars that built that site. You know, why are we, why is the Forest Service housing infrastructure that a private company comes in and is going to charge people five dollars to soak now at this site mm -hmm. i mean it just it's not acceptable um and because bark is interested in seeing um our forests managed as they should be for quiet recreation and and drinking water uh, clean water and wildlife habitat you know we're engaging in decisions that we see as conflicting with those uses mm-hmm well, the Mount Hood National Forest it seemed to me, I, I read somewhere that it is, it is the most visited forest in the country, but it is one of the most visited forests. Yeah, Mount Hood gets uh, six million visitors a year. Uh, you know, where it's it's unique. It's an urban forest because it's near to a, a metro, metro, met, metropolitan Politan area. area. Right. Um, and, and on uh, the other side, too, the people can come up from the other side, too. Yeah. You know? And, and the horseshoe timber sale, this other timber sale that we're really concerned about, is a great example of another one of those conflicts. Um, the horseshoe timber sale is planned right over the top of one of the most visited recreation areas in Mount Hood, and that's in the Zigzag Ranger District, which is on the Sandy River, sandwiched between uh, Mount Hood Wilderness and the Bull Run Watershed Management Unit. Um, and that is... Uh, uh, like it would affect things like the Ramona Falls Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail, Horace Riley Campground, um, lots of really, uh, an area called Old Maid Flat, um, a really beautiful area that um, has actually benefited from a moratorium on logging for the last 15 years. Um, back in the mid-90s, there was a timber sale proposed for this area called the Enola Hill Timber Sale that sparked huge public outcry. That's when I first got involved in forest activism was, was that timber sale. Yeah, yeah, yeah I it, didn't it, know that. It was, yeah, it was, I thought it was early 90s, but it, it, it went on further than that. Right, I mean, it went on for years, and it was... Yeah. Um, what are your, I mean... Well, it was, it was I remember that uh, the Native Americans were involved in it, because mm -hmm. Enola Hill, the actual Enola Hill area, was uh, was a, 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 a gathering for medicines and, mm -hmm. and foods and things like that for Natives. And, you know, Highway 26 goes right along a uh, the old Native trails. Mm -hmm. That's what you know, highways usually do. And that area was used extensively for, for traveling between the Willamette Valley and and the Central Oregon and the tribes all used that. Mm -hmm. And of course, Enola Hill was a was a uh, uh, Vision Quest site, and, and mm -hmm. then you know, gathering uh, the the different medicines and then and the foodstuffs for the for the tribes uh, as they were traveling, or for the local areas. And and that that that's what I remember was that was it was really uh, it was not just you know activist it was it was the tribes were involved in it as well and, yeah. and it went on for a long time and they ended up i don't know they might have saved some of it but they ended up did cut it i believe yeah that that's my understanding too it was a, a really big deal it was partly because of just people being fed up with the amount of logging they were seeing in there which is a really hammered area there were some sacred sites that were were important to the tribes there um and but what happened is that in 1998 the forest supervisor at the time said you know Pub we can no longer basically run up against this kind of public opposition. And she put a um, moratorium on logging in zigzag at that time in 1998. In the last 15 years since that moratorium was put in place, there's been very, very recently, there's been a little bit of logging in the area. And, and it's um, kind of a complicated story. But the the bottom line is that that di ranger district, the zigzag district, has not had a timber program of its own. They don't have their own timber planners, you know, for 15 years. And what has happened in that time is a focus on restoration and recreation in the area. That's what the management focus has been in that area. And the result has been salmon returning to the Sandy River, dams coming out of the Sandy, hikes being led by the ranger district, the district ranger, um, 
and a, and a huge boom in recreation in that area. It's 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 beautiful. You know, it's an area that's had a respite of logging for the last fifteen mm -hmm. years, and now the 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 horseshoe timber sale is on the table and it would impact uh 2000 acres in this recreation hotspot sandwiched between the 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 these two protected areas you know the mount hood wilderness and the bull run watershed management unit um and it's it's imperiling threatened salmon it's gonna have you know noise and view impacts on the hiking trails and campgrounds there it would you know if we don't if we're not able to stop it, but we intend to stop it. And, um, you know, I, and I, and I believe we will, because this is exactly, I mean, it's the same kind of thing that got people inspired about e the Enola Hill timber sale mm -hmm. and that resulted in that kind of activism. Y the forest service should not be, I mean, from Bark's perspective, the forest service, the, the timber program in the forest service is just simply out of control. They've logged, they, there's more than 10,000 acres of logging on the table right now in the Clackamas River Ranger District alone. Now they're branching out into areas that have heavy, heavy recreation use, which isn't to say that the Clackamas District doesn't have recreation use. It does. I mean, that's where I go it, to recreate. It, I hammered. swim in the Clackamas <laughs> River, you know. Um, but we, we don't want, what we want to see is, is the management emphasis for restoration and recreation that we've seen in the zigzag for the last 10, 15 years. We want to see that happening in the Clackamas district, not the other way around. We don't mm -hmm. want to see the timber program that's taken over, you know, more than 10,000 acres in this district moving into an area that is so well loved and so well frequented by recreationists and, and is now home mm -hmm. to recovering salmon habitat. Um, the problem is, and, and I mean, in addition to just having a general culture in the Forest Service that is so timber focused, um, we have a huge turnover right now in Mount Hood staff. We have a f new forest supervisor, the person who who ultimately um, decides what sales move forward. Um, he's been on the forest for about a year and a half. Um, he, we have a new district ranger in the Clackamas River Ranger District. Um, and these are folks who came from very different areas, you know, have, have admittedly... The Geographically different. Yes, exactly. Um, who have admittedly said that they don't, they don't, know what restoration in a wet forest is like we have on the west side of Mount Hood um, who who seem to be willing to walk away from many many years of of um, stakeholder investment and collaborative work on moving forward road decommissioning which is the best thing that we've been able to figure out to do for the health of our watersheds in Mount Hood National Forest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was on the hike with Grady Proctor who also is, is mm -hmm. a bark bark employee and a staff and uh, we went up to Horseshoe, and he was yeah. saying that uh, uh, Obama mandated 20% higher cut mm -hmm. across the board. That's so that means right. that every every uh, every uh, national forest in the country has to bump it up 20%. It means that uh, nationally they're making the request for 20% more cutting happening. But but here's here's something to keep in mind. The the standard right now is about twice as much as the Forest Service in Mount Hood is already offering and cutting a, a year, right? So the there's a, a mark that the Forest Service is supposed to hit for the amount of um, forest they're offering to log. And we get to about half that distance in Mount Hood National Forest. Now, if you tack another 20% on to that, you know, you're basically driving this timber program to be even more ambitious in how they, you know, get the cutout is what we say. Um, mm -hmm. The problem is, is that our forests can't handle that. You know, Mount Hood National Forest provides drinking water to most Oregonians. <laughs> uh, or th I'm sorry, a third of Oregonians get their drinking water from Mount Hood National Forest and something like 90% of the forest itself is the is a drinking water source for some community mm -hmm. um you know as we move through time and we see the effects of things like climate change and we start to feel water scarcity and we start to in this area and we start to see uh you know how how incredibly important it is to protect this really valuable and unique resource we have, which is mm -hmm. an abundance of water coming out of Mount Hood National Forest. That water quality and quantity will be degraded by things like the Nestle proposal to suck water off the off the back of Mount Hood National Forest or um, you know, timber, a, a timber program that's so out of control that they're logging right up, you know, into riparian reserves, areas that are supposed to be protected 
to to maintain water quality and fish habitat. Um, there's so much at stake, you know, and we just don't have the wiggle room for that kind of change. And we don't have the the resources on our forest to plan that kind of timber sale in an, in a remotely responsible way. Um, things like the jazz timber sale, sale where you see the, the groundwork done in, in large part equates to a timber planner driving up a road, looking at the parameter of a proposed unit, kind of checking it off their list, like not even setting foot into that area to see, you know, what kind of fungus do we have here? What are the lichens on the ground? Is there an intermittent stream here? How wet is the ground? You know, what is the understory like? Elevation beyond, beyond the view of the road. Yeah, I mean, it's, mm. it's, and that's why Bark is here, because it is, we love Mount Hood National Forest. You know, we want to see it retain its beauty and its its um, habitat for fish and wildlife. You know, <coughs> we want to make sure that that people can go and and you know enjoy the the nurturing that comes from being in wild places and that's that's what we have in Mount Hood. And there's as you say it's it's very visited quite often by folks and it's it's yeah. it's very popular and uh, it was a point I wanted to make about Horseshoe. Oh, right, you're right. I remember uh, this was said on the hike the other day, but also I've read this on your bark, the Bark site, that's bark-out.org, that uh, not only did people f squeal so loudly about the Enola Hill in, in their mid-90s, but there's also going to be a, a strong coalition of, of uh, folks uh, that are going to be involved in, in fighting this one that typically don't get involved, like Native Fish Society and all that. Yeah, yeah, we, um, you know, people, uh, this is a really controversial, the horseshoe timber sale is really, really controversial. When you start seeing direct conflict with um, quiet recreation and um, the efforts and analysis and funding that's gone into restoring salmon habitat in the area, I mean, the entire horseshoe timber sale is in critical steelhead habitat. Um, and we're talking about sleep, steep slopes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, you 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 know, if you get out into that area, you you see how you see it's a healthy forest. You know, you it's the kind of place that you want to spend time, and it's the kind of place that has been evidence that people want to spend time because so many people go there. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, it touches people in a way that is unique, and and um, I think revisits the kind of controversy and and history. Uh, in Mountain National Forest that brought us things like Enola Hill and the Eagle Creek uh, tree sets. And, um, you know, uh, we're going to see more and more people getting engaged on this sale and hopefully find a way of essentially, you know, conveying to our new forest supervisor, on, on Chris Worth on Mountain National Forest, uh, that, you know, he, he may not know the history of the area because he's relatively new and, and there's a lot of people leaving the Forest Service right now just because it's like retirement time for a lot right. of folks. The this old year. guards leaving. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, is a curse and a blessing. We we haven't been happy with what we've seen <laughs> in, in Mount Hood, but we at least have a history with those folk and we they understand how they understand how engaged the public is in Mount Hood National Forest. Um so we hope with the horseshoe timber sale that we can stop it before it begins. You know, we're very early in the process. We're in um, pre-scoping right now. You know, we've seen, we've had lots of conversation with the Forest Service. They've taken us out there along with many others to kind of see what they're looking at. And what they're looking at is uh, shocking. I mean, we're, we're talking about logging right up against roads that recently just were just were decommissioned in the last two years. We're talking about old growth logging. We're talking about... Um, you know, logging on, like I said, steep slopes that go right down into salmon habitat that has been actively mm -hmm. restored and, and is recovering, you know. I'm, on that hike we went on the other day, there were some areas that were that had stumps that were pretty well rotted. They were like six feet across. Mm -hmm. And then there was, you know, there was also stumps that were like, you know, three, four feet, I mean, a couple, three feet across. So that shows that it's been, it's been, uh, logged at least twice mm -hmm. and it's one of the areas we were in you know it was getting to old growth it wasn't the ancient forest by any means and it was getting to be old growth characteristics with a multi-layered canopy and the and the, all the down woody debris and and the, and the snags and all that it was starting to show that you know another hundred years that would be a, a an old growth forest mm -hmm. and 
we were right in the middle of one of the units. Right. So they're going to take all that out, and it's going to have to start all over again. Right. And I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, 100-year-old plus trees. And we're also talking about plantations, you know, or, or replanted forests. But again, it comes back to this question. Those plantations are there because they logged before. You know, when do we stop the cycle? of logging and then going back and logging again mm -hmm. and then closing roads and reopening roads and wasting all of this money when what we have is a forest that provides Portland its drinking water, provides the drinking water of many, many other Oregonians from Clackamas County to Hood mm -hmm. River County, so, you know, some of the residents of Hood River County. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it does wonders to get out into these areas. And that's why I would, I would again, just remind folks that um, Bark offers free public hikes on the second Sunday of every month. And these are the kinds of areas we go. We go to the Horseshoe Timber Sale, you know, to say this is, this is on the block, you know, for chopping by the Forest Service. Uh, we go into places like the Jazz Timber Sale where you'll find some great mushrooms um, in the wet months, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and uh, what you'll see now, um, and and I guess in the past too, is timber sales that are planned now right over the top of timber sales that were canceled before. You know, in, in the, there's a timber sale called the Grove Timber Sale down in the Clackamas um, that overlaps with the solo timber sale that was stopped uh, several years ago because of some rare lichen that were in the area. Um, we see things like um, like the horseshoe where Enola Hill was, you know, and and so I, my understanding is that some of that some of that logging didn't go forward. But I, I believe you're right that that um, that was a, a proposal that didn't get completely stopped or things like we've just found out that something called the Palali Cooper timber sale is coming back. And that's mm -hmm. a timber sale that was canceled before. And it's and right up on the flanks almost. A matter of that's it. right. That's right. Um, and and other things, too. There's a project called the Red Hill timber sale um, in the Hood River District where a collaborative group, a group of stakeholders that got together and basically worked with the Forest Service from the beginning to try to minimize the controversy of the sale. Um, as a part of that process, they were able to remove some, some, some parts of that proposal. That, that decision, uh, or that um, EA, that environmental analysis, just came out about two weeks after a new timber sale popped up on the map that incorporated the same parts of that Red Hill timber sale that are that were dropped and are now showing up in another timber sale. You know, it's like they're saying, well, maybe we can get to it this way. You mm -hmm. know, and it's just, it's just, uh, th there just, there has to be a point where that kind of management stops. And, and again, you know, with an outdated forest plan that is overdue for revision, um, it's not, you know, I'd like to think that we could see a revision to that. I mean, I believe that we can see a revision to the forest plan that will do a better job of balancing um, those uses of the forest, where instead of having some a, a forest service that prioritizes timber over all else, we see the prioritization of quiet recreation management and management for clean drinking water and, and wildlife habitat. Because... Those are all very important uses of our of our national forest. It's the type of thing you don't notice until you lose it. Well, right. <laughs> you <know? laughs> right. You know, while you were talking, I, I realized that a, a statistic I heard a while back, these are going through all this, you know, taking chances on ru uh, uh, damaging the fish runs and, and drinking water and all that. And we get only like, what, 3% of our forest products from the national forest? Yeah, I don't know that statistic, but, um, but that's what's said on many of the bark hikes. Yeah, that's interesting. A very small amount of our of our forest products are coming from the national forest, and why this got bumped up twenty percent during a recession or a pseudo recession when building and and construction is down. Mm -hmm. We don't. I don't see how we need the wood. Right. Well, and you have things like what we call the big clack cut, where it's. You know, we have 10,000 acres of planned timber sales in the Clackamas River Ranger District. 7,000 of those acres have been sitting there, decided on, a, a, a awarded, and ready to be cut, haven't been cut in five years. Because of the economy. Right. Why? Why? And, and then, you, and then I, I often hear from timber operators or, or folk who just 
who have this mindset that, you know, we need more, like, the, the problem with our economy, you know, it's like, well, they're not offering enough timber. It's like, well, you've got, you're sitting on 7,000 acres of logging and you're not doing it. You know, why do we need to offer you another 10,000? That, there's something out of balance there. I, I think the out of balance is is the is the campaign cash that are going from the industry to <laughs> to to the various uh, uh, candidates mm -hmm. to keep them in in office because I, I know when, when George Bush was here at one time he got like one point two million from like twelve different timber industry. Yeah, well, and there was that story in the Willamette Week Willamette Week recently, um, King of Clackistan that talked about the uh, enormous amount of money that had been put into the Clackamas County races um, by a, a timber company mm -hmm. um Stimson there's, Lunder, Lunder. there's a lot of that going on that you know that that, that that's got to be a lot of the reason why these these uh these uh well not the specific timber sales but the but the amount that co congress is mandating that is getting cut they're not going out into the forest and saying hey well there's we can cut some of this there's there's extra trees their aides aren't going out there mm -hmm. they must be getting their information from somewhere and i think it's probably from timber lobbyists that they're getting their information that they need this well and and what we heard over personal opinion <laughs> what, <right? laughs> what we heard over and over again when the forest service was considering um handing over management of these recreation sites to private companies was we can't afford to manage them you know we don't have the money to manage them and it's like well Where's the money? Where's the money that you're using to uh, plan all these timber sales that you're losing money on going? You know why? Why isn't that money being put in? It, it's the pri there needs to be an agency priority, and and one of the concerns that we had when that initial the the privatization of of recreation in Mount Hood National Forest came up was, you know, if Mount Hood relinquishes control over management of these sites, if or if the Forest Service does, you know. That is going to be a very short-term loss of institutional knowledge and incentive for the Forest Service to request funding for that. You know, they're saying, we don't have the money to keep these campsites open. Well, if you're not responsible for managing them, you're never going to go back and ask for that money again. And in fact, the law yeah. is written in such a way that once they hand that management over, it's extremely difficult for them to get it back. Forest Service unplugged. <laughs> <laughs> unplugged from, from the forest, they're supposed to be... Uh, you know, taking care of. Right. And, and, you know, so, so it's, it's a multi-layered problem and certainly we need to be, we need to be going to Congress and in, in Oregon, you know, to our congressional delegation saying, you know, the things that matter to us, the things that matter to the public, the uses of the forest that go beyond this small industry, um, need to be prioritized and need to be funded. We are going to lose our connection to this land if the only thing it's used for is cutting down trees. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard in an environment like Oregon where we have this romanticized view of what logging is. You know, Oregon was built on the timber industry. Well, Oregon was also built on slave labor for railroads. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's got to come a point where we say we, we need to protect our economy and we need to protect some of these family businesses, but we can't invest deep into the 21st century in an industry that is from, you know, 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just, and I say that because our forests can't handle it. You know, it's, it can't, the, the, if we want to have salmon in our rivers, we can't make timber the most important thing happening in Mount Hood National Forest. From Bark's perspective, it isn't, you know? Mm -hmm. What's important is quiet recreation and fish habitat and wildlife uh, habitat. Um, the answer, but it's a fight. And the answer is to get folks out there. Exactly. The Not exactly. necessarily on bark hikes, but just to recreate and Absolutely. see. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's great. It's accessible. You get there on Highway 26. You can get there off of 205 through Highway 224. You know, there's, it's, it's a very accessible forest for folks. Um, yeah, and you know, go, and have, to the gorge. And it's even accessible if you don't have transportation, you know, you can get a bus all the way out to Estacada, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, and um yeah, and, and, and if you you know, if you want to get out there with Bark, we have our we have our free public hikes on the second Sunday of every month. Uh, we meet as you know, we meet at nine AM at the Trader Joe's in, in the mm -hmm. Hollywood district and we head out there and 
get people on the ground and we have training we do ground truthing you know that's a volunteer activity we can get people out there um, we're looking for volunteers right now because we're doing uh, we're we have an effort right now to do what BMP monitoring or best management practices monitoring where we're going into sales post logging and checking the conditions of the sale and using a scientific model to establish you know what is and what is not working with the systems that are designed to um, mitigate harm in these Mm -hmm. these uh, logging projects. Well, I know that Bark is working on getting its uh, website up into the 21st century. Yes. <laughs> and I haven't seen the graphic come up yet with, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the website. Maybe it has. I just haven't noticed it. Uh, www.bark-hyphen, whichever way you want to say, out.org. Yep. Bark was already taken by a dog or something <laughs> like that. Right. Way, way back. I think they, they, they offered to sell it to us for thousands of dollars or something. Something but, like that, yeah. Yeah, it was ridiculous. But anyway, yeah, bark-out.org. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people can get onto the, onto the website. And uh, there's also 503-331-0374. Um, I didn't write that down, I don't think. I forgot to do that. But uh, 503 five, 3310374 and uh, folks can call up. I bring that up partly because of what you were talking about, but also before that you were mentioning where folks can get involved in, in uh, maybe uh, signing petitions or, mm -hmm. or getting involved in sending letters and all that. And Bark has the availability of making it easy for people, easier for people to yeah, do that. Yeah, our website has information about our upcoming hikes and trainings. It has action alerts. It's got our newsletter. Um, you can sign up for our monthly e email newsletter there where we provide opportunities to take action um, and you can get in touch with us and ask us about our programs mm -hmm. and you know how to get involved. Because there's a lot to talk about there. I mean, yeah. these, these forests, I mean folks drive out into Mount Hood National Forest, they'll see green everywhere you know if they don't have enough of a practiced eye they won't realize that some of the trees are tall, some of them are short, some of them are lighter green than others which means that there's a lot of what you're looking at even though it's green has been impacted severely by logging. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, folks tend to think, well, you know, the, the Forest Service is just, I mean, the forest itself is, a, is a, an area here, an area there, and a watership, watershed there. But uh, folks, I, don't, I think typically folks who don't get up into the forest don't really think of the forest as an integrated unit. And I know the Forest Service does not look at it mm -hmm. that way at all. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is the biggest problem with their way of looking at it and, uh, and the way they conduct themselves towards it is it's, 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 a, it's a complete unit. It's a universe in itself. It isn't just a tree or a bug or, or uh, the uh, fungus under the ground. All those are operating as a single organism. Yep. And to be stomping on it the way they do really, really makes a big difference in how that unit conducts itself. Yeah, and, and I, you know, it, you, make a, you make a great point. It, the, the best way that you can be an advocate for Mount Hood is by going out there and seeing for yourself what it's like, experiencing the feeling of breathing that air and, you know, feeling the, the quietude that you have in the forest, whether it's in a wilderness area or off the high, off, right off of Highway 224 on the Clackamas River. But, you know, for people in Portland or Clackamas County, the other thing you can do is just uh, pour some water out of your tap because that's where it's coming from. It's Mount Hood National Forest is mm -hmm. where, where your water comes from if you're in this area. And, um, that's an important thing to recognize, you know, if you want to have, if you want to continue to have good, clean drinking water that's abundant, you know, make that heart connection to Mount Hood National Forest because that's where it's coming from. And there has been times in the past where they've had to stop giving us water from the Bull Run watershed mm -hmm. and, and use the, uh, the wells up on the Columbia, Columbia River because of sedimentation. Which, you know, I don't know if it came from logging or it didn't come from logging, but it does cause that sort of thing. Well, I mean, that's the thing. The Bull Run Watershed Management Unit is is closed off to logging. It's not a secret that logging impacts water quality. And so what we have with Portland's drinking water is the Bull Run Watershed Management Unit where people can be, I mean, you have to go on a guided tour to even get inside that boundary. There's no logging in that area. And mm -hmm. they did that because, it, you know, uh, they wanted to retain this great pristine water source and mm -hmm. they know that logging is a is a counter indicative activity to having clean abundant drinking water mm -hmm. well so we're down to less a little over four minutes now uh, but uh, <laughs> any particular direction you want to take this maybe we could you could talk a little bit about where we are you know kind of underscore where we are with the, the horseshoe timber sale 
Sure. And, and as far as the public involvement? Yeah, sure. So um, we're really early in the process with Horseshoe. We're hoping that we can build enough um, energy and enthusiasm about this area, which, which really already exists because it's such a frequented area, to g help the Forest Service understand with its new managers that, you know, this isn't the kind of thing that you can do. What we want to see is the historic uh, recreation and restoration management in, in the Zigzag Ranger District around the Sandy River. We want to see that grow onto the forest in other mm -hmm. parts, not the other way around. We don't want to see the 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 over you know out of control over and emphasized timber program encroaching in on this space. In fact, we want to see that shrinking in other parts of the forest. So we're early in the process. Um, like like you said, people can go to our website uh, www.bark-out.org um, to find information about the horseshoe timber sale, or call us at 503-331-0374, or you can email us at info at bark-out.org um, to find ways to of getting out into the forest, seeing that part of 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 Mount Hood. Um, you know, figure out, find out ways to take action online to communicate with with. Um, the decision makers on the sale and i would certainly encourage anyone who um is uh you know a part of an organization that might want to weigh in on, on where i was going next yeah, <laughs> on that or any other timber sale you know a, a, a recreation group a neighborhood association someone on a city council or who knows folks uh in decision making capacities who want to chime in because we're going to need um we're going to need everyone who cares about that area to get involved to make sure that this doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, you know, if you could, if you could just uh, list or enumerate some of the organizations here, like, you know, I, na I mentioned Native Fish Society, but there are specifically like uh, mountain bike organizations. There are specifically hiking organizations, all who have websites. So yeah. what, are some, what are some of the names of um, those? There's, you know, the Mazamas, Friends of Mount Hood. There's IMBA, the International Mountain Bike Association. Um, I mean, these are all groups that people might be a part of who want to weigh in, um, and some who have already, um, you know, Native Plant Society, uh, City of Portland, Portland Water Bureau, you know, because part of the Horseshoe Timber Sale abuts the, that Bull Run Watershed mm -hmm. Management Unit, you know. Um, Fishermen. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, people who fish in the rivers, uh, people who are worried about the stocks of salmon that are coming out of the river where, you know, that use the Sandy River as a place mm -hmm. to... to um, to exist. <laughs> yeah, so, so you know, if, if viewers, if viewers are involved in any of those organizations or know people that do, you know, it would, it would, you know, be worthwhile to tune into the Bark, uh, www.bark-out.org, and and see what's going on with the horseshoe timber sale, and let let these folks know that. You know, if they do like to recreate in that area, you now we're kind of getting away from the jazz because that's pretty much out of public right now. Bark's going to have to be dealing with it with that right now. And and but the horseshoe timber sale is still right there in the uh, in the in the uh, public public response uh, ability. And mm -hmm. and uh, if you don't you know if you don't make up your mind, your mind will be made up for you. And if you don't act, this will go through unless unless there has been a lot of energy to stop it. So we're down to about a minute. You have a finishing sound bite, Olivia? <laughs> We've covered a lot. Yeah, so. well, I mean, I would just say mm -hmm. that, you know, again, um, people who are worried about their drinking water, people who want to have somewhere to go that's beautiful to find respite from the city, people who care about fish runs in our streams and mm -hmm. wildlife habitat, having a place to live, you know, get out to Mount Hood National Forest, contact Bark, join us for a hike, volunteer with us, you know, contribute to us financially, learn more about our group and, 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 more than anything, we just want to see people be activated and engaged in the decisions that affect our public lands. Mm -hmm. And I, when I, a while ago, when I was mentioning, you know, the, the it's all one unit with the with the trees and the animals and the and and uh, and, the, and the fibers underneath the ground. Well, you're also a part of that too. <laughs> you know, human beings are a part of the forest as well, and uh, we need to conduct ourselves in that area. So I guess we're done for now. We got about ten seconds. I want to thank the crew. Double thank the crew for trying as hard as they did. I want to thank the viewers for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.